Welcome to this service of worship. Thank you for joining Christ's ministry here in Port Colburn and around the world. The scripture reading for this fourth week of our Lenten journey is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 to 3 and 11b to 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And then, and they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come, and your father has killed a fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat, so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed a fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost 
and has been found. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> to some extent, this story has always been a shocker because we like to think of Jesus as being the one who was going to improve our ethical standards. We want him to put a little more fiber into our ethical diet, which is often found lacking. And he does that. But in this homecoming of a story, we learned that Jesus' ethics is often different from ours. We find the unexpected, a very different ethics than what we would think of as a moral standard from a point from the point of view of the from a worldly view, viewpoint because we find the unexpected a party for the never do well son our question often echoes the question of the older brother is it fitting to throw a party for a prodigal perhaps a fresher understanding of this well worn story begins when we define which character is the real prodigal. The obvious answer is that the younger brother is the prodigal. He did, after all, treat his father as if he were dead by asking for his inheritance prematurely. He then travels to a faraway land and squanders his estate on loose living. It was not only his money that he lost, but also his chance in life to be someone and to do something redemptive with his resources. But he is wasteful. He is wasteful with opportunity, with money, with his inheritance, and even with his youthfulness as if these decisions were not enough to break his father's heart. The Jewish boy then finds a job feeding unclean animals. It would seem that he was determined to turn his back on his father and all that his father loved in order to satisfy his own pangs of emotional and physical hunger. The less obvious answer to who is the prodigal is the son who remained at home. While he does not ask for his inheritance, he does resent being the one left at home to tend to the farm and to satisfy the father's wishes. He shows this in his refusal to address his father with an appropriate title and his refusal to claim the prodigal as his brother. He refers to his written brother, written brother only as this son of yours. This elder son is so tight that he has never asked for a goat with which to have a party with his friends. All he could see was that his father's forgiveness was a grand waste. Yet the parable ends with this brother also lost. He is lost because of his inflexible principles, his envy, his judgmental attitudes, and his resentment over his father's generosity. In each case, neither son shows concern for his father's feelings. Both distance themselves from their father's concerns and activities in different ways. Both seem to resent their father's control, <coughs> their father's control of the farm and the limits they perceive it sets on their lives. Both, at some stage, seem to prefer parties with their friends rather than meals with their father. So who is the prodig prodigal? Is it the younger or the elder son? Let me propose that it is neither. 
For the prodigal in our story is the father. The father is a prodigal in that his love is extravagant and more excessive than either the younger brother's loose living or the older brother's moral rectitude. His parent is, this parent is excessive in his persistence to claim a family. He's the one who impetuously meets us when we drag in from the far country after good times go bad, or who risks coming out to the lonely darkness of our righteousness, or the rigidity of our sanctimonious ways of be living and begs us, come in, come into the party. It is a father who continues to be dreadfully wasteful, for he gave away his son, Jesus Christ, in order to claim us for the kingdom of God. It is the son, it is this son, who told the story in the first place. For Jesus told the story to those who prided themselves on being hard workers and on having earned the love of their heavenly parent. These were, however, the same persons who openly despised Jesus for wasting his time with those whom good folk regarded as human waste. Tax collectors, prostitutes, beggars, and the incurably ill. Though these, however, were the very ones that Jesus said would enter the kingdom of God before the super workers, it is quite likely that Jesus wanted the hearers of the parable to go away wondering, is it wasteful of God to be merciful to outcasts and derelicts, to those who have wasted their lives? Is it prodigal of God to open the realm of heaven to persons like the returning son? In his book, The Return of the Prodigal Son, Henry Nouwen points out, Jesus became the prodigal son for our sake. He left the house of his heavenly father, came to a foreign country, gave away all that he had, and returned through his cross to his father's home. All of this he did, not as a rebellious son, but as the obedient son, sent out to bring home all the lost children of God. Jesus is the prodigal son of the prodigal father who gave away everything the father had entrusted to him so that I could, so that you could, so that we together could become like him, and return with him to his father's house. This story confronts us with a world where we have a home, where there is someone who is determined to love us, and where brothers and sisters who leave, and resentful brothers and sisters who won't leave, are all claimed and waited for and celebrated. But please note that the story does not have an ending. We are left to wonder if the older brother will accept the father's invitation to come in to the party. And we don't know if the son who came home, the pro prodigal one, was restored to his inheritance or just ended up drying wages like a higher hand. In the best storytelling fashion, Jesus leaves the story open-ended so that we must finish it for ourselves, and we are. For every church family has its younger brothers. These are those who are always gasping for air, threatening to leave, and sometimes leaving with their share of the inheritance. But before we become too judgmental of them, Always keep in mind that there exists a younger brother within each of us who is gasping, reaching for space, and kicking at the established boundaries. 
The older brother is also known to us. He's ever dutiful, thoughtful, caring, concerned, and eventually filled with great resentment. This is the sibling who carries too much of the moral weight and gets tired of all of us others who never seem to shape up, at least in their estimation. So in the search for today's ending, do not neglect the most prodigal one of them all, the father. For in the end, it is the father with whom each child has to deal. And in each case, the father gives them exactly what they need. The younger son is accepted back home and given a place of belonging. And the older son is given reassurance. You are always with me. Everything I have is yours. Then he extends the invitation to come inside to the party and to celebrate. This story asks each of us an important question. Will you go in? Will I go in? Will we go in? Will you go into the feast of forgiveness? Will you go into the party where all are welcome? Or will you remain outside? One thing is certain, though. The party would not be complete without us. Amen. Let us join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have called us together as your people to be the Church of Jesus Christ. Make us one in faith and discipleship breaking bread together and telling the good news so that the world may believe you are love. Turn to your ways and live in the light of your truth. Creator God, you made all things and called them good. We pray for the earth in its vulnerability depleted by our lifestyle choices and our economic expectations. Inspire reverence for the earth in all people. Guide us all to make wiser choices for the sake of your creation. Help us use resources wisely with future generations in mind guarding the fragile balances you have set between many precious species. Jesus Christ, you are the Prince of Peace, and you taught us of God's reconciling grace in the story of a father who welcomed back his wandering son and invited his jealous son to open his heart. Speak to the hearts of all your people in this time when so many neighbors and nations sit in judgment on each other, provoking conflict and resentment. Teach us how to seek peace on earth together. Call those in positions of power and influence to work for the common good, Turn us away from anger, fear, violence, or vanity, which can turn neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. May all who claim your name be known as makers of the peace. O Christ, healer of hearts and hopes, you desire health and wholeness for each one of us. We pray that those who have lost their livelihoods in this pandemic may find true abundance. Grand rest and renewal to those who are broken in body, mind, or spirit. And bring comfort and hope to all who face loss and loneliness. In silence, we leave before you the names of those on our hearts today.
spirit of power and promise. Embrace us with hope this day, so that we may live faithfully, encouraging each other by the commitment we see in Jesus Christ. Taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Forgiven and beloved ones of God, go now in peace, sharing with others the good news of God's love. Help those in need. Give and receive from each other the joy of peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace today and in the days to come. Amen.